voted, and I would want to commend the Honorable Eric Evelyn. I gather, while I was not on the, the, the uh, Zoom call, that he acquitted himself well, as we are to expect from any representative from the island of Nevis. He did incredibly well, and so I certainly uh, celebrate with him. I understand, of course, that we are in a particularly difficult period in our country. And uh, there is a whole host of things that I had here to speak of, but you will forgive me if I pivot immediately to talk about the current situation in the country involving the COVID threat. Ladies and gentlemen who are here, those who are listening and viewing, you will recall that as Premier of Nevis, I have come time and time again at this podium right here at this press conference. I've come time and time again uh, on the radio, on my Wednesday show, on the mark. I've come time and time again on social media and at every forum to encourage our people to prepare themselves for COVID-19. How do we prepare ourselves? We prepare ourselves by trying to maintain our safety at all times. We have for a long time practiced the non-pharmaceutical measures, the washing of hands, the wearing of masks, the physical distancing, measures such as curfew, measures such as lockdown, quarantine. We also have available to us now a pharmaceutical measure, which is the vaccine. And I do not believe that it is any secret that there has been some vaccine hesitancy in the community. There has been hesitancy, and that hesitancy has been fueled in large measure by those who ought to know better, who have whipped up a frenzy of opposition to people being vaccinated particularly people who find themselves on the front lines, security people, police, military, people who are on the front lines in terms of our hotels, our hospitality sector, who engage every day with guests and with others, our teachers who every day are engaging with students, and the students, of course, are a high-risk group because they fall outside the group that we would vaccinate. Most students are under 18. It therefore means that most of our teachers on a daily basis are spending sometimes eight or more hours with an unvaccinated population, our students. And that means, therefore, that they too are put at high risk. Now, I am no soothsayer, but I believe that the evidence from elsewhere has shown us that those who do not prepare themselves put themselves and their families at most risk. If we hear that a hurricane is coming, the reason we have advance notice is so we can stock up, we can board up, we can ensure that we protect ourselves and our families. If we hear that there are thieves or murderers loose in the community, we lock our doors, we put up our shutters, our burglar bars, we ensure that we protect ourselves and our family. It is no different with COVID. COVID is a monster. It is a monster that is bent on destroying us, destroying lives and livelihoods. We have seen it at work on our television screens every day. In our neighboring islands and countries, we have seen how COVID has struck other lands. And for some reason, the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, and let me speak more specifically to the people of Nevis, have in some quarters formed a view that it won't affect them. And so here I am today, again, pleading, begging and beseeching, but in a context where things have changed practically overnight. And we advised that that change has come from where? A situation that has developed with somebody who's on the front line and unvaccinated. Getting the virus, taking the virus into the community, into their home, to their family, friends. And we have seen from that and other occurrences on our sister island of St. Kitts that there are now over a dozen new cases 
And so whereas before we were able to say that we had a very low incidence of COVID, that overnight our cases have gone up by more than 25%. And the contact tracing is not yet over. I have heard some comments in social media and elsewhere, and the visions have been quick to say, oh, that is over in St. Kitts. Let me tell you something. That is not so. We cannot divorce these two islands. We are one country. And what happens in St. Kitts happens in Nevis and vice versa. We are one people, one country, mixed by blood and marriage and history and culture. And so while many advocated, it appears for us somehow to build a wall around Nevis. I am saying to you that this is a time when we must be our brother's keeper and our sister's helper. We have seen this played out elsewhere. In our neighboring island of Anguilla, we saw what one breach there did. And overnight, they had dozens and dozens of cases in Anguilla. I have used the Anguilla experience to ask our people to look just next door to Anguilla to see what is happening and to pay heed and take precaution. Some have responded favorably. Others have continued to be apathetic. To say they don't care. They not nah take none. Nothing not happened here. And look now what has happened. Overnight, over a dozen cases on our sister island of St. Kitts. And so the people of Nevis, since I am at this point in our history, the premier of this island, and therefore I am standing here today speaking to the people of Nevis, and I am to say to you that the contact tracing has also started in Nevis. You know why? Because there has been exposure of people on Nevis to those who have tested positive on Sinkits. We are advised that one of the positive cases was actually in Nevis, visited Nevis visited friends, had lunch, used the ferry. I say that not to alarm anyone. I say that to demonstrate how inextricably connected we are and that it is foolhardy for us to think that because something is happening in Bastyr, that Charleston is immune or vice versa. Because I would be speaking in the same way if the outbreak that we were seeing was on Nevis, I would be saying similarly, our people are interacting more now than ever, particularly since travel has been curtailed for many. We see our people moving between the islands freely. And so I urge our Nevisian people not to look at this as if it's some distant land, some geographic space from which we are removed. To the contrary, this is your own country, your own kith and kin. And if it is that we are seeing cases on St. Kitts, then we also must prepare ourselves while we pray and we hope that we don't see cases on Nevis. It gives us an opportunity, my fellow Nevisians, my fellow residents, it gives us an opportunity to prepare ourselves. A window to say that this vaccine is available, let us go and get vaccinated. Because it is the only proven scientific way that we can hold COVID at bay. That's important. And I really want to make that point that in a way we're being sent, in my view, some messages. We are being sent some messages. From where? Those who are Christian minded will say perhaps from God. Who's sending some warnings to us. These are messages that keep coming to us. We were told, look what is happening in America. People say America far from us. Well, look what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, I don't have no family in Trinidad. That's far from us. Look at St. Lucia. Look at Barbados. Look at Anguilla, our own people in Anguilla. Yet, 
our people did not pay heed. Well, now look at Sinkits. Are we going to wait until we hear about cases in Butler's and Brown Hill? Is that what we're waiting for? What will it take for our people to understand that this is not a joke? This is life and death. And the life that they save might well be their own. The life that they save might well be their elderly mother or grandmother. The life that they save might well be their unvaccinated child. To our teachers, who I have appealed to privately and publicly, among those that tested positive in St. Kitts, our students, primary school students, among those that tested positive in St. Kitts, our teachers, it is not that I was prophetic, but to me, it is a logical progression. When one thinks logically, one can see the potential for danger. And therefore, in my position as a leader, I must warn against it and encourage our people to do what is right. And so to our teachers at all the schools in Nevis, many of whom have still not yet vaccinated, I say, just look across two miles to your colleagues on St. Kitts. We had a meeting, quasi-cabinet task force meeting yesterday, which ran from, I believe, about 5 o'clock to almost 8 o'clock in the night. And I was privileged to participate in that meeting to see firsthand the hard work that is being done nationally and here in Nevis in the war against COVID-19. And during that meeting, the issue was debated. And that issue was, since the cases now are cases on Sinkits, should the restrictions only apply to Sinkits? Some may ask that question. But I go back to where I started and what I said earlier, that we have evidence that at least one individual would have interacted on the island of Nevis. We also have evidence that some of our teachers would have journeyed to St. Kitts and engaged as they ordinarily do with their counterparts in St. Kitts in meetings and training sessions. I say that to say that whilst we know not at this point whether Nevis has any cases, and incidentally, members of the press, our contact tracing on Nevis, I believe yesterday we would have done 10 samples all through the grace of God have come back negative. Among those samples, I'm told, were two students at two different schools who had come into primary or secondary contact with the individual, I believe it is case 48 from St. Kitts. Through the grace of God, they tested negative. But we understand that we will continue that contact tracing. We have, for example, to look at the ferry if you look at the people who would have traveled on that ferry on that day. And I want the members of the press and the members of the public to understand the level of effort that is required to find people, to do so in as timely a fashion as one can, given the circumstances, to seek as much as possible to get those people interviewed, to get them to isolate, to get them into a situation where they pose no threat to others. It is an incredibly difficult task that our technical people continue to undertake. And I want, as I've continued to do, to publicly thank Mr. Abdias Samuel, the chair of the task force on St. Kitts, his cohorts on that task force, particularly CMO Laws and Dr. Wilkinson, but also to thank our local task force here, headed by Dr. Judy Nisbet. They go above and beyond to keep us safe. And so, last night, late, after eight, I believe it was, we took the very difficult decision, well, 
let me not say we took, we communicated because we're taking a decision probably a half an hour before it was communicated that we had to close schools, not just on St. Kitts, but across the Federation. I want the division public to understand that these are not easy decisions that one arrives at. As a parent myself, I understand because I've had the benefit of my own history raising children. That for a parent to hear at 8 o'clock or 8.30 on a holiday Monday night that tomorrow there's no school puts that parent in considerable difficulty to find daycare, to find babysitter, to find some place safe for their child. Because people have to go to work and people have obligations. I understand how that decision would disrupt people's lives. I can assure the members of the press and the public that what we have sought to do is to ensure that there's no disruption, or let me put it differently, there's no undue disruption to our students, that they will continue from the primary school level to have their lesson plans administered by their teachers. The teachers will continue to work from home. They'll continue to administer the necessary guidance and instructions to their students. And for the older students, particularly those preparing for exams, we know that overseas exams are due shortly, that the online platforms that we have been using will continue to be used to give instruction, guidance, and education to our youth. So we do not at this point anticipate that there will be too much disruption. And I hasten to remind the public that this is for two weeks in the first instance. We are optimistic, members of the press, members of the public, that we will see these signs and signals and we will take them seriously. We will see this hurricane coming off the coast of Africa trending towards us and we will take it seriously. We will not be like the foolish virgin left out at the end of the day. We will act prudently and sensibly as responsible citizens to protect ourselves and our family. This risk could have been mitigated had our people taken up the opportunity to vaccinate themselves. This risk could have been mitigated had we done that in sufficient numbers. I am to advise that we will be making the clinics available to our people. I have asked the Junior Minister of Health, the Honorable Hazel Bandy Williams, and the Permanent Secretary, Shalisa Martin, to do everything in their power, including making clinics available at evenings, if necessary, so that our people can have access to the vaccine. Yesterday, we had a special vaccination effort at the Gingerland Health Center and over 110 persons were vaccinated in the morning session that we had there. We would want to see that expanded. We have vaccines which will expire at the end of June. It therefore means that there is an urgency for persons to go out. And if this number of cases, this cluster that we're seeing on St. Kitts is any indication, if the risks that it poses to Nevis is any indication, I'm urging our people to protect themselves. I don't know how better, how more I can say that, how, what better language I can employ. If I could say so in Spanish and in French and in German, I would use those languages. Alas, I am limited to English. And so I am begging, beseeching, urging our people do not see these signs and ignore them. If you ignore Trinidad, and you ignore St. Lucia, and you ignore Angola, do not ignore St. Kitts. Because St. Kitts is Nevis, and Nevis is St. Kitts. Please let us go out and protect ourselves and our families. This now has got very real 
in a very short space of time. We're not now dealing with the theoretic position, a theoretical position. We are not now saying, oh, look at CNN and you see what's happening. No, you can look at NTV and ZIZ and you see what's happening. I'm sure you may have questions on that, and so we'll get there when we get there, I hope, in a short space of time. Let me say that I anticipate that the Honorable Prime Minister will at some point speak to the nation and if and when he does, that there may be other restrictions announced. At this point, and I emphasize at this point, we have had no indication, no recommendation that we go into a lockdown. But I emphasize at this point because we do not know where all the contact tracing will lead us. And we are concerned at the very real question as to the connection between the most recent cases and the last set of cases that we knew originated at a particular hotel property on St. Kitts. So absent a clear connection, because the last set of cases did not arise from contact tracing, my understanding is that someone presented themselves to the hospital feeling ill, being symptomatic or tested and showed up to be positive and their entire household was then tested and showed up to be positive. I hope that the members of the press and public understand what I'm saying, that we now have a situation where there's no clear connection, although that is still being investigated. That means that none of us can say that we are safe. Those of us who are vaccinated can say that we are in a much better position because the science shows that we are less likely to contract the disease. And if we contract the disease, we are unlikely to be symptomatic and certainly unlikely to die. Those who are unvaccinated, and I'm advised that the majority, the vast majority of those afflicted by this disease are unvaccinated individuals. That raises its own level of concern for us here in the country. So members of the press, as always, I ask you to help me and to help the island and the country. I have come in the past to make the arguments about our economy and recovery, but it's also important now that we talk about life and death. We talk about our health care. We talk about our capacity. If suddenly we have hundreds of cases, can we handle it? And what does it mean for us if the country is forced again into hard lockdown? I don't know about you, but I certainly did not like to be locked up in my home. And I believe I can speak for the majority of people that the freedoms that we take for granted, that we enjoy, to go out jogging and to go down the road and line with friends and to go by the bar and have a little drink, to go on the beach, and go by one of the bars there and hang out and listen to a little music, that when those are taken away, when you're forced to line up again to go supermarket and only essential workers are allowed out, that you get fined and confined for being on the road after certain times or being on the road at all, that that is not a nice feeling. And so whatever it takes to persuade our people, I'm saying, Examine yourselves, your families. Look at your little daughter at home. Look at your grandma at home. And ask yourself, should you expose them to this deadly disease? I think not. I will leave the issue of COVID there for the moment. I'm sure that, as I said, you may have questions on that. And let me just go very quickly to one other matter. And that is, if COVID presents some bad news for us as a nation, then I believe that this presents some good news for us, and that is that MSR Media, which, as we know, the Nevis Island Administration was successful in negotiating a two-movie deal with MSR Media. 
as we sought to realign, readjust, to diversify our economy, as we recognize through COVID that the heavy dependence, in fact, some may say the over-dependence on tourism was problematic, that we did not sleep. We tried our best to find alternatives. And we had always harbored dreams of having a film industry in Nevis. And so your government and the cabinet that is under my leadership at this point in our history went to work. And we were able, through the assistance of others, Ms. Jadine Yard, CEO of the Nevis Tourism Authority, Mr. Jacob Katzman, who has been an advisor to us on the Nevis Investment Promotion Agency, redesign, redevelopment, and Mr. Colin Doerr, our permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance, that they, through their joint efforts, would have brought to us a Mr. Philip Martinez and MSR Media, a filmmaking company out of the UK. And we took a chance. I spoke to them first, last December via Zoom, and I told them that Nevis was open for business, that we wanted a film industry here, and that they ought to come here. I took a chance on them, and they took a chance on Nevis. And they came in January. I am very pleased, therefore, to announce today that the original two movies are done. One, romantic comedy called One Year Off, and the other, a thriller called Assailant. They are both complete, and the filming on those is now done. Both were filmed on Nevis, with some scenes, I believe, that were filmed on our sister island of St. Kitts. It therefore means that MSR has satisfied its agreement with the NIA and with Nevis. But Mr. Martinez and his team have been quite enamored with our island. And what is there not to be enamored with? Nevis is the queen of the Caribbean. So they have come, they have fallen in love, they have found a government that is easy to work with, and they have decided that instead of pulling up and moving out after their contractual commitment, that they will extend that commitment to the people of Nevis. And so today, members of the press, I am pleased to announce that the NIA and MSR media, late last week, concluded an agreement which will now run over the next three years. And that agreement is to produce between three and six films per year over the next three years. And I believe that starting where we started from just two films to now a long-term agreement, three agreement, to produce three to six films per year over the next three years, right here on the island of Nevis, is incredible news for our people. Along the way, MSR is advising that their staff complement is now up to 80, 80, in terms of crew and support. That on each film, they are using local actors as extras. And that as part of this agreement, they Acting Academy, which they started, will continue to offer acting lessons to those on St. Kitts and Nevis who have the acting bug and who would be interested in acting in movies. In fact, I am pleased to say that on the last movie that they made to satisfy their contractual obligation, that movie being the thriller Assailant, that some seven persons resident right here in Nevis and St. Kitts were able to find roles in that particular movie. And all seven, I'm told, are products of the Acting Academy. So the Acting Academy, which meets at NEPAC, we have provided that facility to them weekly to prepare our local people for acting roles in movies to come. And I don't know about you, members of the press, but I look forward to the day, I hope God will bless me with long enough life that I can see the day when the island of Nevis and the people of Nevis are showcased right next to all these high-flying actors and actresses who have come to be a part of films here. 
it has not stopped there. But in terms of skills transfer, I'm also pleased because a lot of youngsters here now are involved in the film business. They are involved in the production. In fact, I'm aware that the young division who studied film is even as we speak en route back to Nevis to play a role. And that is what we want to happen. We want to reach to a stage, ladies and gentlemen, where when MSR or whoever else may come, that they have local talent, a pool of talent, a pool of individuals right here who they can rely on to provide the necessary expertise and support for the film business. My government has not been idle. We went into the Nevis Island Assembly, if you recall, and we passed the Nevis Film Commission Ordinance. And again, the idea was to create a piece of legislation which would be a first step to deal with licensing and permitting for films to take place here. We are in every sense committed. And I am particularly delighted that as I started talking about COVID and emphasizing that we are one country, that this industry brought to the Federation by the NIA that it has already started to pay substantial dividends for the people of St. Kitts as well. Scenes are being filmed over there. Workers have been sourced from over there. People coming in are quarantining at the Marriott over there. And we now have a real industry developing centered as it is here on the island of Nevis, brought as it was by the NIA, but benefiting the entire country. And I always say that development in St. Kitts is development in the country. Development in Nevis is development in the country. And we need to start to see our country as ours, one country, with all the fruits of our citizenship being available to us. I made a point in the past, I'm told that some were unhappy when I made the point, but that is okay. It's not my job to make everybody happy. That everything and anything in this country must be available for all of us. So to my brothers and sisters in St. Kitts, movies making in Nevis, if you have the acting bug, you want to be part of production, filmmaking, sound, stage creation, costume, hair, makeup, come to Nevis and get involved. My brothers and sisters in Nevis, whatever you hear, keep us sink it. Get involved. It's your country. You're entitled. Somebody says something a keep, put yourself with something a keep so you can benefit from it. If you want to be Governor General or Prime Minister, go for it. Wherever you're from. Newtown, Deep Bay, Sandy Point, Tabernacle, Brown Hill, Barnes Gut, Butlers. Whatever is available in this country is available for all. And I urge our people to think like that, to understand that. When good comes, it should come for all of us. And equally as we're suffering now with this flare up in terms of COVID, when bad comes, it also comes for all of us. Today, all of our schools are closed. All of our students dislocated, our parents dislocated, our teachers at home. And I spoke to that earlier, that it is something that has happened and we're treating it as one country. So I would want to make that very clear, but I hope the press and the members of the public would see that as a government, we have not rested. We have not said the sky is falling like Chicken Little. We have not said, woe is me, woe is me, toys is me, shut down, what shall we do? Every day, we get up and we go out. And we go fishing for the people of Nevis. Like any fisherman, not every day is catching day. But every day we are out there. And we have fished, 
and we have caught a film industry that is now bearing fruit. And for any institution now in these difficult times to say that they are employing 80 individuals on the ground right in Nevis, I believe that that is a welcome initiative. And so I hope that members of the press might find it appropriate to give a little headline about the film industry. I know some of you would have doubted me when I said initially that this was an industry that was coming. But I'm optimistic that you now appreciate that it is not only coming, it is here and it is paying dividends. Let me publicly thank Mr. Martinez and his team. They have thus far delivered all that they say they would deliver. And I believe that this has thus far worked well for the people of Nevis and for the wider federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Let me just a few other quick matters, members of the press, and then of course I'll invite your questions. Let me go quickly to public works. The people of Cherry Gardens have suffered for a very long time. What have they suffered from? They've suffered from the fact that they were sold homes in Cherry Gardens, many of which had inadequate soak away and septic facilities. I believe all of us have driven in that area, very nice neighborhood, but seen people's yards flooded. In fact, I recall going there one time to visit, and a particular, particular young lady, a single mother, had water almost a foot and a half high settling around her house. They have some people who have turned their water from their washing machines into the street because the soakaways are inadequate. We pledge to fix it. Even though most of the homes have been there from a previous time, and even though those homes are long past the time when the Nevis House and Land Development Corporation would have any responsibility for doing anything at those homes, we have come to the realization that the good people of Cherry Gardens were sold homes with inadequate infrastructure. And so we have stepped up, and we have, in addition to those that we've already fixed, identified an additional 31 homes that require amelioration. The initial cost was estimated $217,000. But we have since revised that based on one that we did recently to $280,000. We think it cost, it'll cost a bit more than the 217 that we had budgeted. The 280,000 should include the cost for plumbing, machinery, materials, trucking, and any restoration of fencing. We might have to, of course, knock down somebody's fence or part of it to get to the back, to the septic. We did a study, because I want people to understand this was not some haphazard approach. We did a study, we had an engineer who went in did the assessment, made a report to the cabinet, identified the homes. We have since gone and we have spoken to the homeowners. We have somebody from Public Works who's leading this effort, and the affected homeowners have been contacted. We expect work to commence shortly. We are putting the funding in place. We would want the people of Cherry Gardens, please, to cooperate with us. We understand that construction is disruptive, but at the end of the day, we expect that you will have more comfort in your homes and the community will be safer and healthier because there will be no runoff water, no gray water that is going into the streets or flooding people's yards, which as we know can be a breeding ground for mosquitoes and the like. So there's a public health component to this. There's also doing right by our people because these were homes that were built by a government and sold to people and these homes had defects in terms of the soak away and septic. Now, I was surprised. I thought that this would be news that all people of goodwill in Nevis would rejoice at. But I was surprised to see that the usual, the usual suspects have attacked this initiative. I don't know why. Because we could either have said to homeowners, you're on your own. You fix it yourself however you can which in my view is unfair to people because those who sold them the homes knew that there was a problem with their septics and soakaways. 
And so in addition, I'm told to the nine or 10 that we've already done, we are going to do 31 additional ones that we expect to start soon. This is a promise that we have made and a promise that we have kept. In my language, which I prefer, it is a commitment that we have made and a commitment that we are now keeping. I will lastly refer to our severance pay situation. I'm aware that this has been a matter which is vexing for many people, many here on Nevis and across the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. I'm aware that in these difficult and perilous times, people have complained and say that they're not getting their money quite fast enough. I'm aware that there are many large employers and large groups of employees who have had to wait a very long time. And wherever possible, I've come and tried to update. Well, I give an update this morning because the numbers that I have from the Ministry of Labor here, the Labor Department here on Nevis, is that thus far, the monies paid out to workers on Nevis as severance pay is $8,295,968.46. In relation to the larger employers, Nisbet's Plantation, every person there has had 56 persons applied and 56 have been approved. Paradise Hotel, 24 applied, 24 have been approved. Bananas Restaurant, 22 applied, 22 have been approved. Four Seasons Resort, which was always the most troubling because of the size, 415 persons would have applied. Thus far, 373 would have been approved. It means that there are 42 still pending. And it is my hope that those 42 will be processed as quickly as possible. The process has been difficult. It has been laborious. It has been exacerbated because, of course, the severance payment fund is inadequate to fund this level of demand. And so the federal government has had to find the resources, since they're the ones who deal with severance, to satisfy these claims. And that, too, has led to some delay. That is no comfort to people who are still waiting. But I would want simply to remind the people of Nevis that you have representatives who are in St. Kitts and Bass, they're working on your behalf, who continue to agitate. And I would wish to publicly commend the Honorable Eric Evelyn and the Honorable Alexis Jeffers because we raise this matter regularly at the federal cabinet. And I believe that these numbers that we are seeing suggest that there has been significant movement thus far. And so we are seeing claims being processed. I'm told, again from the statistics provided to me by our own local Department of Labor here, that the total number of severance applications for 2020 were 805 from Nevis. And the total number approved to date is 704. It means, therefore, that those pending total would be 88. And of those, as I've indicated, the Four Seasons has 42 that are still pending. So I believe that that is reasonably good news, that some progress has been made, and that we hope by the next time I come that all claims would have been processed and our people paid. Ladies and gentlemen, I had some notes about Culturam. I had some notes from tourism. And let me just end. I will leave Culturam for now. But just to say that the park at Pinnies, every time I come, I give you a percentage. This morning, the percentage is 63% complete. The landscaping, which we're doing simultaneously, is 39% complete. And the expectation is that the week before Christmas, we should have a grand opening. So we are optimistic that we will get there. Thank you. I will leave it there and take your questions. Good morning. Good morning. Monique Washington, Sink It's Nevis Observer newspaper. Um, the last time that we were here, you revealed that persons wishing to renew or apply for residency or work permit must be vaccinated. 
but she didn't speak on the consequences of what will happen if they don't. Can you say no? What are the consequences if they refuse to take the vaccine? And how has the response been since the announcement? Can we get an update on the burning of the bathhouse and the government's plan for that building? And schools and decades are now officially closed for the next two weeks. Has any consideration been given to parents of babies or toddlers as it relates to caring for their children during work hours and at the hospital? You spoke a little bit about the hospital the last time we were here, and you said the shell is completed, and there needs to be some work done to the interior as it relates to the flow of the hospital. So extra work, extra money. Um, how far will this project be over budget? And last but not least, an update on the Newcastle Police Station. Thank you. Okay, let me start where you ended. New, Newcastle Police Station, all furniture and appliances are in. I have a note here, actually. You know what the note says? Monique going to ask this question, so I write in this for Monique. All of the furniture, I'm going to read, read your note, Monique. All of the furniture and appliances are in, and we are awaiting the arrival of beds, which is due here tomorrow, the 26th. The beds were expected to be on the 12th, but were delayed. Okay, so I hope that that is sufficient and the police are anxious to move in. I have been in touch with them and there's a constant communication between my office and the commissioner and the high command here on Nevis. Uh, the hospital, you asked how much is going to be over budget. I'm not in a position to answer that. Um, I believe that we will come with a formal report on the hospital once we are in a position to do so. Um, as I indicated, the shell is complete now and that we had a delay, of course, occasioned by COVID, but we also had a delay occasioned by the fact that we had to get some consultants in to deal with the internal flow. All of that has now been settled, so I anticipate that we will be moving apace to get that project completed for the benefit of the people of Nevis. The question of cost is one that certainly, in the usual way of being open and transparent, I will come, uh, Monique, and certainly you can call me privately. I don't have the numbers with me today but you can call me privately and I'll give you that information. Um, toddlers and caring for them, I started out by saying that we empathize with parents. We understand that it is difficult. Uh, the cabinet will meet tomorrow in the usual session here on Nevis. The cabinet I know in St. Kitts is meeting today. Um, clearly I can't be there because I'm here with you, but I feel that this is an issue that we'll have to look carefully at. I don't have an answer for you because I think we need to deliberate in cabinet to determine what, if anything, we'll be able to do to assist those parents. You will recall that when we had the initial shutdown, this government had taken an approach with our public servants that those with small children, young children, could have spent some time at home with those children because clearly children require care. Um, we will look to see whether or not there's room for that type of approach again. But in the interim, we empathize with parents and we urge them to try to make whatever arrangements they can with family members or otherwise, because this is expected to be, we hope, just a two-week period. It gives us an opportunity to pause and to ensure that we know where we are in relation to this outbreak that we have seen overnight happening on our sister island of St. Kitts. Bathhouse, um, it was a very regrettable incident. Of course, the bathhouse is a uh, a structure of significant historical value to the people of Nevis. And the police are still trying to investigate how this building left in its state with no electricity, none of that could have caught fire. So that is an ongoing investigation. I have no update at this point on the investigation, but I can say that we are saddened, deeply saddened, that the bathhouse would have been subjected to fire. And we do not know yet the extent of destruction of that very historic property. And to thank God that it was not the Bath Hotel itself. But to urge our people, as I've been doing, particularly our people in the Bath Village area, who I know take great pride in owning that compound, as taking it as their own, that they keep an eye out. Because if, if this was vandalism, I do not know if it was, but if it was vandalism, then we need to appeal to our people to cease and desist from any such activity. Our heritage is who we are. Our heritage has value. It has tourism value. It has historic value. It is important to us. 
and therefore we must do what we can to protect it. Insofar as the government and plans, the government has many plans, money. The problem always is the money to execute some of these plans. And the Bath House in particular, we had long been looking to see what we could do to restore that. And we went as far as UNESCO. Because it's a historic building, it's not one you can simply send in masons and carpenters and stone masons to deal with because you want to preserve the historic nature of that building. And the last I checked, I believe they were trying to get artisans as far away as Italy to come in who had the expertise in restoring that kind of facility to come in. Uh, that, of course, again, was upended by COVID with no travel. We are optimistic that over time we might be able to do something there and to salvage something of the bathhouse. You asked about persons vaccinated, work permits, residency. Uh, that was the policy prescription that the cabinet came up with. I came and I was very uh, forthright about it, that the reality is that those who are seeking to come into the country to work, come into the country to live, that even now they're required to satisfy certain health prerequisites, bar in which they would not be allowed to come in. And the same is now true, that we are saying that if you want to come here to live and work, then please be vaccinated. It would be unreasonable, Monique, for me as Premier of Nevis and for this government to be badgering, begging, beseeching our own people, meaning people who are born here, who live here, who never string berry here, to vaccinate. And we tell somebody who's coming in from New York, oh, you can come and set up without any need for vaccination. That, I think, would be incredibly inconsistent in terms of our messaging. So the question you asked, what is the consequence? The consequence is obvious. If you don't satisfy the requirements and you can't get the work permit, you can't get the residency because it is now a requirement. We have had no particular um, difficulties. The Premier's ministry is advising. People understand. And in fact, it has in fact, based on what I have been told, not impacted many people who are already here on the ground. Why? Because it's st the statistics suggest that the vast majority of those who have taken the opportunity for the free vaccination have been the non-nationals. So the truth be told that a lot of people who are dependent on residency or work permit have really not been adversely affected by this because they were front of the line when the vaccination effort started. Just yesterday at the holiday vaccination effort in Gingerland, I went to Gingerland to see for myself. There were some crowds there. And when I went in, I had to use a little Spanish I knew to speak to some of the people there. So instead of saying hello, I said hola. And I referred to them as la gente, mi gente. Our people, my people, because many of them were Spanish people. And that is the reality that they are taking advantage. Our own people. Me not take no vaccine, me not do this, me not do that. So this really is impacting those who are outside, who are planning to come, who want to come. Some of the hotels, for example, are constantly saying to us, we need to bring in a chef, we need to bring in whoever. And people come in with their families, we're saying they must be vaccinated. So if they're not vaccinated, tell them don't come. Because we do not want to add to the unvaccinated population in Nevis. Not when we encourage our own people to get vaccinated. So I hope that that is clear, what it is we're seeking to do. Any other, other questions? Good morning. Devon Good morning. Cornelius, WinFM. Uh, can you provide an update on online teaching equipment and access? Uh, can you also provide an update on the enforcement of COVID-19 protocols via tickets? And can you give a date as to when the Newcastle Police Station will be occupied? Thank you. Well, you've asked me the same question that Monique asked in a different way. Monique asked where we are, and you've asked what date. Uh, if it were up to me, Mr. Cornelius, people would have been in there already. Uh, but we understand. Uh, in fact, I should share with you that we actually approved from the NIA some purchase of furniture at TDC. And the purchase order was already done. TDC was already geared up. 
And then the commissioner of police advised that he, in fact, had some furniture that he would prefer to use and send over. And so we thanked him and the federal government for that. Of course, national security is a matter for the federal government. But um, the beds is the holdup, because as we say, we've had a delay. Uh, the, 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 Mr. Daniel, Wakely Daniel, PS, has been working really hard on this matter. And he's telling me that the beds should be here tomorrow. And if the beds are here tomorrow, Mr. Cornelius, I would expect that to put the beds together and put the mattresses, which we have already, on top of the bed. What do they call it? The old people say bedstead. Bedstead. To put the bed mattress, the mattress on top of the bedstead. Bed frame is the modern language. People my age used to hear grandma say bedstead. Mr. Cornelius, you never hear that language yet in your life. <laughs> so... To put the bed, the, the mattresses on top, I don't anticipate it will take any time. And as I said, all the appliances and everything are already in. There's some cos cosmetic work that also needs to be done, because as people are now moving in, there's an issue, I think a minor issue about some additional ventilation that will be done, and there's an issue of a, a glass partition that has already been ordered, and that as well will be done. So I don't anticipate that there'll be any further delay, and really I would hope that the police and fire services are comfortable by this weekend if those beds come over as is planned tomorrow. Um, what are we doing in terms of teaching on the online platforms? Just before I came here, Mr. Cornelius, I was advised that the teaching, the platforms are up and running. Why? Because as you may know that some of the schools, even prior to the announcement last night, were already doing online. Some of them were doing a hybrid. So some of the students were going half day to school, half day online. So the platforms were never taken down. So they're still available, still being used. And my anticipation is that they will be put to good use to ensure that there's no disruption for the teaching of the children. In terms of enforcement, we have just put out calls. I think we are seeking to find 12 uh, officers uh, for our protocol enforcement on Nevis. Um, what had happened hitherto is that the police, a lot of that burden fell on the police. And so we're now trying to get uh, 12 civilians, so to speak, to come forward. Um, applications are to go to the Commission of Police. And those individuals would, would, would spearhead now the effort in terms of enforcement on Nevis. The police have done, I think, a good job. They have shut down a lot of events that were not in compliance with the requirements. And we have, since this outbreak that we've experienced on our neighboring island, we have, of course, urged that protocols which might have lapsed that people get serious again. So for example, wearing our mask in public, and since I'm on television, let me say I'm not wearing a mask because you're far away from me. Um, and, it, and, and that is the only reason. I, I did bring it in, walk in with it, but I took it off as I was about to come to the podium. Uh, and so wearing the mask, ensuring that we have the social and physical distancing and continuing to sanitize, wash our hands, sanitize our hands with sanitizer with high alcohol content. And of course, the continued quarantine and measures such as those, we have employed to good effect. And the final measure, of course, is to ensure that we are vaccinated. So these are the measures that we continue to employ, uh, Mr. Cornelius, and it is the hope that we can get back to some sense of normalcy after the next two weeks. It is my hope that numbers in terms of vaccination will jump considerably, given what I call a sign that we have. And as I said, and I think it's worth repeating, if we ignore the sign from America, and that from Italy, and that from Brazil, and that from Trinidad and Tobago, and that from Barbados and St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Anguilla, let us not ignore the sign that is right now in our backyard on St. Kitts. Good morning, Mr. Premier. Good morning. Um, what is the potential impact of, say, a curfew or a national lockdown on the government's finances and the overall economy? And the federal government announced, I think, that cruise ships or at least one cruise line is supposed to return to the Federation in July, I'm thinking. And then the nation will officially open back up in October. That's, that's uh, what they're preparing for. So is Nevis prepared for this? Because I know at St. Kitts, the SCASPA, which is the sister agency of NASPA, 
would have implemented certain policies that if you work there, if you're going there to do business, if you're coming there, period, even to look over the fence, you have to be vaccinated or you will not be allowed to come on the premises or to do any business. Taxi operators have been told similar. Um, what is the approach of the NIA in that regard? Okay, you asked a very important question, and as much as possible, we need to coordinate efforts that what applies on St. Kitts should apply with Nevis and vice versa. It is not always so, because Nevis has its own internal government, and that's why I'm here standing in front of you as the Premier of Nevis. Uh, but to the extent possible, as clearly was demonstrated just last night, with closing all the schools in the Federation, even though no students in Nevis have yet tested positive, there is a high degree of coordination. I believe that the policy that SCASPA has put in place will have to be looked at by NASPA to determine whether or not we put something similar in place in relation to those doing business. I can say, however, that recall there is a qualitative difference between Sinkits and Nevis in terms of crews. Crews is a significant part of the Sinkits tourism product. Crews is not a significant part of the Nevis tourism product. The Nevis product has always been about stay-over visitors, heads and beds. That's what we have always had on Nevis. Sinkits has a mix of the staying bed and the cruise, but the cruise has been by far the more dominant because in Sinkits, as we know, just I think two or three years ago, they had over one million cruise visitors. Nothing like this sort would happen in Nevis because we neither have the facility nor do we market ourselves as a cruise destination. So I believe that the preparation that you're seeing for cruise on Sinkits is a necessary preparation because of the significance of cruise to the Sinkits economy and to SCASPA. That is not the same on Nevis, but we have to look to see that we have a consistency of approach, even for the small ships that would normally come to Nevis. I have not yet seen from NASPA any indication as to when those small ships will return. All that I've heard at this point is that the larger ships, at least one company, as you say, will return to Sinkits, hopefully, sometime in July. And so we will look on and to see. I will also tell you that I believe that some of what SCASPA has announced is really as a result of policies that the cruise ships themselves, the cruise lines themselves, are indicating that they require. So my understanding, for example, is that the cruise lines are saying that they do not want their guests who are expected to be vaccinated to be served or engaged in anything with unvaccinated people. So put differently, if you're a taxi driver, they don't want their guests in your taxi unless you're, the taxi man is vaccinated. If you're doing a zip line or catamaran or whatever service you're offering, whatever tour, they don't want their guests engaged because they have liability issues. If a guest who's fully vaccinated were to come into contact with somebody who is not, and something were to go awry in, in relation to COVID, there's a potential for liability. So the cruise ships themselves are apparently stating what their requirements are. And I can understand why they would say that. And SCASPA, I think, is responding in part to that by saying, listen, these are the requirements for SCASPA. If you want to be on the pier, if you want to apply your trade, if you want to have the monkey that people can pet, all of that is necessary that you be vaccinated. And that has been the requirement there. Um, in relation to curfew, potential for a lockdown, what effect will it have? It will be devastating. It will be devastating. Our finances are already at an all-time low. Our main engine, tourism, is still substantially offline. So if we're going to lock down, we are restaurants, our bars, our business communities shut down. The potential for that, of course, is that the country comes to a standstill. And I know, Ms. Hewlett, that many have focused on the economic impact of lockdowns. But let us not forget that there's also a social and psychological impact that I believe is still not yet fully understood and still not yet fully evaluated. What does impact do to the psyche of our people? The inability to move about, the inability, humans are by their nature social creatures. 
What happens when a government tells you that you are essentially isolated from others? If you live alone, for example, you may well get up every morning and you look forward to going to work, to engage with workmates. You may look forward to church on a Sunday to engage with members of the congregation. All of a sudden you're told you cannot leave your house. So that engagement that you look forward to each week disappears. What does that do to you? These are still things that are uncertain. But I can tell you that here in Nevis, our mental health register has increased in terms of persons who have sought assistance. Our register for those who are seeking counseling has increased. And we feel that a lot of that is connected to COVID. That is the unseen part of the health crisis of COVID, that people are having psychological, mental, emotional issues as a result of lockdown, joblessness, hopelessness. So all of these are factors that we have to take into account. The decision to lock down will not be a light decision. It will have to be based on the evidence. It will have to be based on the fact that there's an outbreak that we feel the only way to do it would be to lock down. At this point, I hasten to say that based on the discussions that I was a part of last night, that is not on the table. But I do not rule anything out because COVID is a fast moving threat. Today, it is not here. Tomorrow we wake up and we hear we have 15 and 16 cases. That is the nature of COVID. And so no lockdown on the table at the moment, but it is a rapidly evolving situation. And we'll have to see where the contact tracing that is still ongoing takes us today, tomorrow, and over the next few days. Any other questions for me? Good morning, all. I am Mr. Hanley, and today I'm here representing Black Home Channel, and you can find us on YouTube. Question number one. Um, Mr. Hanley, boy, you said Black Home but, Channel? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Question number one. We can no longer depend on tourism as our main employer due, due to the rapidly changing world. As a result, countries around the world are now investing in their own people and local businesses. In light of this, what is the government doing to assist businesses and create new sustainable employment on the island? Question number two. In recent times, Indian Castle has been described as a crumbling wasteland. The horse race truck is totally abandoned and left to rot. The livestock farm is totally destroyed and replaced with kusha trees. Indian Castle is now a dumping site. There is no support for fishermen. My question is, when will the government clean up the mess it created at Indian Castle. Question number three, as foreign minister, can you let us know what percentage of federal expenses such as overseas missions, ambassadorial upkeep does Nevis contribute? Final question, there is a concern within the community that a small group of persons are making a lot of money from the pandemic. My question to you is, Mr. Premier, are you being paid by the World Health Organization or any organization to promote vaccines and to administer them on the island of Nevis? Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Hanley from the Black Home Channel, thank you very much for your questions. Um, Small group of people making a lot of money. Um, I, I hope perhaps you can come back and give a bit more detail in terms of who this small group of people might be and what's the money that they're making and from what. You ask me, however, a specific question. If I am receiving money from the WHO, uh, I can say that I am not receiving money from anywhere other than the salary that I get from the federal government. I have foregone my salary as premier, as you know, for the last several months, I think for the last year and three months or thereabouts. 
And uh, I am not aware that the WHO is paying anyone because I do not know that that is part of the mandate of the WHO. We have heard a lot of conspiracy theories out there and people are spewing all kinds of things. In fact, I, in a conversation I had recently with some youngsters in my constituency, they said when you took the vaccine, you became a magnet and that anything metallic would stick to your body. Some say it's the mark of the beast prophesied in revelations. People say all kinds of things. But we do not need to repeat everything we hear or we read on Google or whatever for the simple reason that we ourselves ought to be able to decipher what is sensible and what is not. And vaccines have been around now for a very long time. And I keep making the point, Mr. Handley, that you have been vaccinated, I have been vaccinated, everybody in this room has been vaccinated. Maybe not against COVID, but certainly against a number of other things. Mumps, rubella, measles, TB, polio, tetanus. If you go down the road right now and you get cut by a piece of rusty galvanizer, you get dug in your foot by a nail, you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna go to the health center and the first thing the nurse is going to do is give you a tetanus shot. Vaccine. Are we in the habit of asking the nurse, nurse, what's in that shot? I need the ingredients before I can take it. If you go to the doctor right now, Mr. Handy, and you say, Doc, I have this cough, I have this pain in my stomach. The doctor sometimes writes a prescription and only through the grace of God you could understand what some of the doctor's handwriting is saying. But you take it and you go down where Mr. Evelyn, drugstore, and they take it from you. They look at it. They know exactly what the doctor is saying to them. They fill the prescription. All you know is it says take two every morning after breakfast. And you take two until it's finished. You never ask if somebody is paying Evelyn. The WHO is paying that doctor. None of that is ever a question. Here we have a situation with something that can kill us. We know it can kill us because we have seen the evidence all around us. And yet we concoct every story imaginable to dissuade people from saving their own lives. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I wonder, is it that some in the country want this pandemic in its full rigor to hit us? Maybe if people start to fall sick and even, God forbid, were to die, then it would give some an opportunity to say, look at the government, it has failed. I wonder sometimes if that is the hope. Because in my view, anybody who is intent on leading must lead in a positive way and must be willing to encourage people. You think when I stand up and I encourage our people to save a little money if they can. You think it's because their saving is money that I will spend? No. If I get up and encourage our people to exercise, is it because their exercise will make me fit? No. It is because leadership involves offering to our people what is in our best judgment to be the best way for them. Otherwise, why are you a leader? If as a leader I simply say to people, well, it's up to you. Do whatever you feel is right. So if a man goes down on the pier and decides he's going to throw himself over the pier and he can't swim, and he looks to me as a leader, he says, Premier, what do you think I ought to do? Well, whatever you feel is right. Is that leadership or should I tell him it is dangerous for you to throw yourself over the pier? You might die. I therefore urge you not to do it. But it seems to me that some are in the river on the bank. And that they are fearful that if they tell people to go out and get vaccinated, they will be offending. So they say, it's up to you. Whatever you want to do is your decision. That is not leadership. That's waffling. And people who come with outlandish conspiracy theories are really just designed to dissuade people. Mr. Hanley, I don't mean you huh, personally, but I use your question as a springboard to say those few comments. I conclude by saying that the WHO is not paying me, nor am I aware that they're paying anybody else. 
the vaccines are available to save lives. And I would urge you and other members of the media to encourage our people to do the right thing and to protect themselves. Foreign Minister, you asked me how much of our overseas missions, ambassadors, how much of that cost is paid by Nevis? The answer is none, because it is not a responsibility of the Nevis Island Administration. If you were to have to re regard, Mr. Hanley, to our constitution, it sets out very clearly what the responsibilities of the NIA are, and therefore what we budget for. So foreign affairs is firmly within the purview of the federal government. That is why I can't appoint an ambassador as the premier. The NIA cannot appoint any ambassador. The NIA cannot hire staff for our embassies. That is a matter for the federal government. So the budget is a federal budget because your foreign affairs is firmly a matter for the federal government. That is similar to defense and national security. Again, a matter for the federal government. So that's just a question of familiarity with our constitutional construct uh, that the island of Nevis would not contribute financially to our overseas missions or embassies because they don't answer to anybody in the NIA. I happen to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but if it were a different Minister of Foreign Affairs, for example, when it was Timothy Harris or Sam Conder, then Nevis had nothing to do with it at all. So I hope that you would understand that it is not a constitutional responsibility of the NIA, and therefore the people and taxpayers of Nevis do not make any direct contribution. It's not a budgetary matter. Indian Castle, you have said that it's a crumbling wasteland. I don't share your view, but I understand that that is your view. Um, I think Indian Castle, the fisher folk there, have continued to ply their trade as they have always done. We have provided support to all the fisher folk on Nevis. We have provided free fish pot wire. We have discounted the cost of additional rolls of fish pot wire. We have assisted our fisher folk as much as possible. In fact, Mr. Hanley, our fisher folk responded by lowering the price of fish that is sold to the fisheries department here as a way of giving back because they acknowledge the extent to which we have been assisting them. So I am not sure what you mean when you say we've not provided any support. Fishermen get duty-free access to a vehicle uh, to ply their trade. All of this we have done. They can bring in implements, they bring in their boat. If they have to bring in a boat, also duty-free. So all of that is in place already. So I'm not so sure what you mean when you say there's no support. Um, insofar as you say the livestock farm has been destroyed, I think that Indian Castle had a, a very um, robust uh, cattle uh, farm there. I believe, again, Mr. Hanley, if you had, if you had bothered to, to investigate, you would know that they have moved the, the livestock from Indian Castle over to Madden's, which is now the primary farm. And I'm advised by the Deputy Premier and Minister of Agriculture, the Honorable Alexis Jeffers, that they have only recently uh, prepared some 30 plus acres of land at Indian Castle, which is currently under all kinds of fruit trees and other fruit bearing plants. Um, so that is there. I, and I believe that in time, you can go, as we intend to go as a cabinet sometime soon, to visit that farm. I think it is under the management of a young man, um, uh, Banky, uh, what's his correct name? Uh, Mr. King. Mr. King is now the guy who's running that whole uh, farm there, 30 plus acres. So again, I don't share your view that Indian Castle has been abandoned at all. You are correct in relation to the horse race. But that has been abandoned now for some time in large part because, of course, that is the site where we were talking about the Amman and now talking about a possible one and only resort. And uh, the discussion with the Turf and Jockey Club was to change the location of the horse race track. Those discussions are still ongoing. In fact, it was only about a month ago that we went out and toured some possible sites for a new horse race facility. So, I don't share your view on that. Um, I, you, know, you, you, you have asked the question by referring to it as a wasteland. I don't share your view at all. I think that Indian Castle has tremendous potential and is being utilized as it has always been utilized. You said tourism is no longer uh, viable. Um, that's my word. Um, I do not think that that is accurate, Mr. Hanley. 
It is true that tourism is fickle and that our, our over-reliance on tourism has been laid bare by the COVID crisis, that the COVID crisis has demonstrated that we cannot put all of our economic eggs in that one basket of tourism. But that doesn't mean that tourism doesn't still have relevance. I will be the first to stand here and tell you that tourism has tremendous relevance to the Caribbean. The Caribbean is a brand name. Nowhere in the world elicits the same response as when you said to a young lady, we're going to honeymoon in the Caribbean. Tell them your honeymoon in New York and LA and London and all that sound good, but nothing. The Caribbean is a brand name like when you tell somebody about a Rolls Royce or Bentley. Caribbean. So the Caribbean has, I believe, reputationally, and through the gifts that God has given us physically, geographically, we have an inbuilt advantage in the tourism sector. It is no surprise that nearly 40%, I'm advised, last numbers I saw, of the global cruise industry is focused on the Caribbean. 40%, think about that. So the truth is that the tourism is always going to be relevant. What we are trying to do in Nevis is to say that while tourism continues to be relevant, we need some other things. That's where the film industry and the emphasis now on agriculture and food security, the incentivizing of the construction sector, the real estate sector, the financial services sector, the small business sector. This is where now this government has tried to be innovative and has said we need some additional strings to our bow because the one, the one string which is tourism we can no longer rely only on that. But I want to be pellucid that what we are saying is we want additional things, not to replace tourism, but to give us additional economic engines to the local economy. In relation to our own people, investing in our own people and local businesses, you have raised that question time and time again. And my response to you has always been the same, that we have tried to incentivize local businesses. In fact, I have spoken ad nauseum about a $5 million fund that we have. I believe I saw a press report recently which said that well over $2 million from that fund has already been dispersed. To whom? Young men under 35 and to women. And they can get up to $100,000 to jumpstart as seed money to start a little business. And that again was a response of this government because we said young people whatever their idea, had real problems persuading banks to lend them money. And women also had problems because many times, as you know, you go to the bank, the bank wants life insurance, it wants you to have property, it wants you to have collateral, it wants you to do all of these things you can't manage. So we said, could we create something? SIDU, Small Enterprise Development Unit, has always had a, a, a system there of advancing up to $25,000. But we know that that sometimes is just not enough. So we approached the Taiwanese government, and the Taiwanese president, President Tsai, I would like to again express my thanks to her. She loved the idea. When I pitched her the idea, she loved the idea. Why? Because, of course, being female herself and very positive about encouraging women, she liked the fact that the money would be earmarked in part to women. And so we thought that as $100,000 EC, 40000 US, you gave people a little bit more latitude to really do something. If you're going to be doing a little, little restaurant, you want to grab and go, you want to do a delivery system. You know, Mr. Hanley, maybe you're good at making pizza, so you want to make pizzas at home and deliver to people, but you want a pizza oven, and you want some other bits and pieces. The 25,000 EC mm -hmm. might not have been adequate. So we said $100,000, and we have said at 4%, I had hoped to get it lower, but it worked out that it was 4%. It's administered through the credit union. And the idea really is that we give people a little, a little start. And hopefully, with that start, they'll be able to turn that into something. Remember that every small business, and some of you in this room are small business owners, every small business equates to employment. Whether it might be just you. I mean, you are the CEO of Black Home Channel. So it might be just you. It might be that in time you're able to bring along three or four youngsters with you. But every business has to start somewhere. 
And even if it's just you, Mr. Hanley, employed in your business, you're one less person who's out there looking for a job. Because every small business generates activity for that small business owner. So that is part of, part of what we're trying to do. So I believe that we have sought to do well. And as you know, my personal approach is everywhere I go, I promote small businesses. Everywhere I go. I have a, a, a small social media following, and I use it relentlessly to promote small businesses. From the man giving a haircut, to the man frying fish, to the lady making a drink, whoever I see, and I, they have a good product, I try to advertise and promote them. And to be honest with you, Mr. Hanley, we have done, I think, a marvelous job here on Nevis, particularly since COVID, of appealing to our brothers and sisters from St. Kitts to come over and be a part of what we're doing in Nevis. And if you go to the bars and restaurants and hotels on Nevis, on most weekends, you see our brothers and sisters from St. Kitts over here in large number. That too is part of the appeal to our people to support the small businesses on the island of Nevis. You see Nevisions in St. Kitts as well in large numbers. And so we have that interaction, that interconnectivity that one would expect in any country. So it may not be perfect. In fact, I will be the first to tell you, it is far from perfect. I would love for all the restrictions associated with COVID to be removed and for restoration of normalcy. But until such time, we are serious government grappling with serious issues. And as I always say, serious issues require serious attention from serious people. And I believe that we have demonstrated that we are serious people. Any other questions for me? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Premier. Just one question, Jarvis Brown from Vaughan Radio. Uh, as it relates to CX results last year for Nevision mm -hmm. students, are you in a position to give an update on that? And that's my question, sir. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jarvis, please forgive me, but I am not. I don't like when this happens, but that question, uh, nearly a year after CXC, I really would not have anticipated. But um, I can get you the, the numbers. I believe that the Honorable Troy Leibert would have given an address back then, and um, so too would have, uh, I believe it would have been at the time, the Honorable John L. Powell on St. Kitts when results would have come in last year, late last year. But I will see if I can find that. I'm pretty sure NTV would have reported on that address given by the Honorable Troy Library, which would normally set out what the results were like, whether we're doing better or worse, as the case may be. So I apologize I don't have that with me today, but I'm sure it is archived and we can find it there. Anything further for me? Um, last question. Uh, we know that schools are closed due to COVID-19. Can you give us the reason why school children are not vaccinated? Um, Mr. Hanley, that is the, the science that the doctors have said to us, that the vaccine, the, the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine that we're using is not, at this stage anyway, to be given to those who are under 18. So that is the reason why that population is outside the vaccination group at this particular time. Uh, I suppose that may change as more research is done because I'm advised that uh, elsewhere, um, I think it was Pfizer, for example, has said that they can now be given to those who are teenagers. But the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the one that we have available, the advice that we got from the technical team is that it was not appropriate at this time to give people under 18. That is the reason why school children are not being vaccinated. It is because that's the advice that we have. Uh, similarly, initially, as you know, they would have given advice saying that if you were breastfeeding, you ought not to take it. Uh, again, that was the advice. If you have underlying conditions, then you should check with your doctor um, to determine if it's safe for you to take the vaccine. So there is no, no mystery to it other than that was the advice that came from the technical team and the experts in relation to the use of the Oxford AstraZeneca and who it should be used for. And the target population, therefore, we have said, is between 18 and 80. That's the target population. Any more questions for me? OK, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you to the various media houses who came, WinFM, uh, Black Home Channel, uh, The Observer, Vaughn Radio. Uh, thank you as well. 
uh, to all of those who make this possible and uh, of course uh, to Mr. Tyson and his team who set up all this great backdrop here and who have taken technology to the next level here on the island of Nevis. Another small business. It's not a small business person showing the way. And we, of course, try to support our small businesses, as Mr. Hanley has reminded us we ought to do. Thank you, and take good care. And we hope again to see you next month for another press briefing.